I am a, I am a uh, blessed man for sure to have uh, the family that I have and um, grateful for uh, their support and love and encouragement through all we do. Melody is the one person I can count on in being in my classes and and uh, she's we uh, about 10 minutes ago she was the only person in here and I said well you may have to hear this lesson by yourself so I uh, she's thankful some of you showed up as well, but we did. We came to Bear Valley um, and trained after being uh, preached for years, and then but never had been officially trained. And went to Bear Valley, went back to Tennessee and preached for a while, and then they called and asked me if I wanted to come back and uh, work with the school. And so I work in the development department. I get to teach a couple of classes in the program, and and it's just a blessing to be involved in that work, and it's. Certainly a blessing to be here with all of you. We're thankful, uh, again, I said this I think every session, but we, we've just really been overwhelmed at the, the love that's been shown uh, here at this congregation. And, and uh, I had heard great things about Linda Road for years, but uh, once you experience it, you really appreciate why so many people have so much to say that's good. We are witnessing Jesus, and today we're going to be looking at this in this hour Witnessing Jesus' commendation of the widow. And so we're going to look at what Jesus uh, commands, the things that Jesus, uh, about her, that he's going to be positive about. You can be opening up your Bibles to the book of Mark because that's where we're going to be. And we're going to take a little bit of different approach probably in this class and what you might expect uh, because the, the text that was given to me is only a few verses long anyway, and um, so we want to, uh, probably for time's sake, there wasn't as, there's not as much material there as you might uh, uh, normally think about for a, a 45-minute lecture or a 30-minute sermon even, perhaps. But I think there's a, a very important thing that he's doing with the text, and I don't know that we always get what he's doing with the story or the account, of the uh, the widow who gives the two mites. So we want to answer a few questions as we look at it. The first thing I want to do is to talk about what does the text say. We want to make sure that we get that correctly, and then we can look at what we usually do with it, and then I think the point that he's trying to make. It's important for us to look at Scripture uh, from those perspectives. So what does the text say? And as we get into a text and start breaking down a text, if we can start figuring out what's going on, the facts, the facts leads to some principles that we can get, and then the principles can lead to some application. And so that's uh, kind of the way that I go about when I'm, I'm studying a uh, text. Well, when we look at this particular text, it is one that is, uh, if you turn over in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, uh, at the very end of that chapter really is where he's going to get into uh, telling us, uh, Mark is, about what happens between uh, Jesus and his disciples and, and uh, looking at what this widow did that was so significant. Uh, in verse 41 is where we begin. It says, and he, and of course that's Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury. So he is in the temple and there's a place where they would walk into and buy and they had had uh, several uh, containers there that were shaped like horns in which people could uh, put money in. They were labeled for various ministries that would have gone to. And, and it's not unlike what today we'll do whenever we might have a, uh, a special collection for uh, a particular work, be it a, a building fund or something of that nature where you, you recognize here's a need and, and I can get involved in that need. And, and all of these people are going in and, and dropping money into the that and it says that Jesus began observing how and you notice I've got that highlighted because that's important and we'll show why that's important in a minute but observing how the people were putting money into the treasury now by that it doesn't mean he's not watching to see whether they they flip the coin in there or they do a hook shot in there or or the the actual method physically by which they put in there but Jesus is looking on something far more important when he's talking about how they put their money into the treasury. And he's not really looking at the what. He's not looking at the amount, although that's what we're going to spend some time on. What Jesus is looking at is how 
they were giving as they were giving. So he's watching how the people were putting money into the treasury. And, and he tells us about, first of all, one group of people, the many rich people. Now, understand, we sometimes have this negative connotation automatically when we hear that, about the rich people. Is there anything wrong with being rich? Absolutely not. Nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having money. Uh, in fact, uh, even sometimes we misquote what Paul writes to Timothy, that money is the root of all evil. That's not what he says. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And if you really want to get right down to it, when we think about rich and poor, most of us, if we're asked, are you rich or poor, we might say, well, I'm one of the poor ones. But worldwide, guess what we are? We are very wealthy, very rich. You know, it's no, uh, it, it's no mystery as to why people want to come to America. Um, because there is such wealth in this land. There is such opportunity in this land. And when you think about, you know, if you've got clean running water uh, that's available on demand, if you've got more than one pair of clothes, a uh, set of clothes to wear, if you've got shoes, and for most of us, multiple sets of shoes, uh, we're among the wealthiest in the world. So uh, we needn't think negatively automatically about the rich, especially when we really are the rich. There are many rich people who are putting in large sums. Now, is there anything wrong with giving large amounts of money to ministry? No. I just knew an elder would say, <laughs> absolutely not. You know, uh, There's nothing wrong with that. We need people who are blessed uh, in financial ways and materialistically. We need them to, to not be so in love with those things that they... They're not willing to be generous. In fact, you look in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and that's one of the things that, that he had, one of those groups of people out of several that he deals with in 1 Timothy, one of them is those who are wealthy. And he says that there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but they need to be generous with that wealth. They need to be willing to give it to those who are in need. They need to be willing to do good works with it. We need people that have money who are willing to use that money for the Lord's glory. We need that. Uh, in the work that we're involved in in the Bible Institute. We need people giving money for that. And there's been a lot of good because some people who are financially well off have done that. Congregations need that for the various works that you're supporting and those types of things. The, the, the work of the Lord, because we live in a physical world, needs physical blessings. So nothing wrong with that. But again, Jesus isn't really noticing what they gave, remember what Jesus is noticing? How they gave, right? The second thing that we see that he notices is this poor widow who came in and put in two small copper coins, which amounts to one cent. The widow's might, maybe the way that in your Bible, if it has the titles of the pericopes, may have put this. Just a, a very small amount, an insignificant amount. Have you ever been walking up to Walmart or to the mall or to the grocery store and uh, you look down and you see some money on the ground did you always pick it up always okay my my father-in-law's that way so when they come to visit us what I usually do is I take a dollar and I go to the store and I get it all back in change and I toss change around everywhere because he gets so excited. Look, I found a nickel, you know. Well, for me, and maybe it's because I'm out of shape, I don't know, but I, it has to be worth me to bend over to get to it, you know. So if I'm walking down uh, towards the, the uh, Walmart and there in the, in the parking lot in my path is a penny, may not, may not bend over for that. It's a $100 bill, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to dive on it like it's a fumble in the national championship game, you know. But this amount is one of those that we might walk by and we might not. I mean, it's just, it's not significant amount. It's not anything that, that you know, when they are opening up the coffers, if that's all that had been put in there, all right, the budget's met. That new work we wanted to do, we, we've got it. You know how we were concerned about how we were going to cover that cost? We've got it now. There's nothing about her gift that's going to make anybody excited when you think about the amount that's given. But again, Jesus is not noticing the amount. 
he's noticing how it was given, okay? So you keep reading and you see that, that he calls his disciples to him. He said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributions to the treasury. Now wait a minute. <laughs> These rich people were putting in large sums. She put in a little amount. Which is bigger, large or little? I mean, I'm not a math major. I'm a preacher, so, you know, sometimes I have to take my boots off if I'm counting too high. But, but even I know large is bigger than little, right? When you put the large amounts on one side of the old balance scale and you put the, the two little coins on the other side, guess what the scale's going to do? It's going to do this number, right? But Jesus isn't looking at how much they gave. Jesus is looking at how they gave. And he says, when you look at how they gave, now he's not saying anything negative per se about what the rich people gave or did not give. He's just saying that, that when you look at what was given, she gave more. And the reason was, was because of how she gave. See, the poor widow, when you look at how she gave, when you look at the rich people and how they gave, there was a difference. There's a difference in the amount. That's what immediately we're drawn to. But Jesus is looking beyond the amount as to how they were given. For they, the rich, put all in out of their surplus. So did they miss that? Did, did they really lose anything? I mean, by definition, the word surplus is, is what you have that's extra, right? Right? That's like me uh, having, you know, a dozen donuts, and at max I can eat 11, you know. So, so I take that one and give it to one of you. Have I really given? Now, if that's the only thing you've had to eat in the last three weeks, that's a big deal to you, right? But we're talking about from how I've given. When it's the surplus, when it's the extra, when it's what's left over. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, <clears throat> isn't that the way a lot of times we give to the Lord? We fill out the budget with, I want this, and I want that, and I need this, and I need that, but I want this, and I want that, and then after all that takes place, then on Sunday when the plate is passed, then whatever's left, I give. Then you have this widow, she gave out of her poverty it, it she put in all she owned she put in all she had to live on she she as a widow in this time and place especially she didn't have means to to acquire wealth she didn't have a way to to earn a living she didn't have a way in which to to become wealthy and rich and very well off she had to live on just what she could scrape up and get by with. And what she had to scrape up and get by with, she put in and gave. And see, what impressed Jesus was not the amount that was given. What impressed Jesus was how she gave. These other guys didn't give anything that didn't mean anything to them. She gave what meant everything to the Lord and to his work. Now, here's what we usually do with that, with those facts. What we usually do, and, and by we, I'm talking about us preachers, okay? So I'm, I'm stomping on my boots right now, okay? This is what we usually do with this. I love you too. This is what we usually do with this, is we preach a sermon on giving, don't we? And we say, now what we need to do is we need to give like the widow. Give till it hurts. Give till you can't give anymore. Now let's pass the plate one more time and see. Now let's pass the plate one, you know, we just go on and on. And we preach our giving sermons with this text. And certainly the how we give is involved in this. And it's something that we need to think about. I've heard it said before that there's really three kinds of givers in the church. There's those givers who are like flint. The only thing you, way you can get anything out of them is if you hammer it. And then all you get is sparks, you know. You probably know some people like that. 
There's some people that are like sponges. They'll give, but you've got to really squeeze them to get them to give anything. And then there are people that are like honeycomb that just naturally overflow giving, you see. We ought to be like the honeycomb, right? We ought to be generous with what we have. We ought to be willing to, to give. And we ought to give in a way that shows that we're trusting God is going to take care of us. Okay? But is he really talking about giving in this context? Or is he talking about something deeper? See, if we're going to take the, the story of the widow's mind and we're going to try to apply it to us in the way we give... If you think about it, how did the widow give? She gave everything she had. So how many of you are ready to do that? Write that check that clears out every one of your accounts. Come while we stand and sing. Right? That's not what he's talking about, is it? That's what she did, isn't it? She gave every cent she had. And there's only one, but she gave every cent she had. And if we're going to apply that to us, that's what we're going to have to do. To be willing to give how she gave was she gave everything she had. She gave what she needed to live. I'm not sure that's exactly what he's really trying to get at. If you look at the context. So what's really going on in this passage? What is it that Jesus is really commending about her? What is it that really makes Jesus happy and proud? Well, to understand that, I think we've got to understand really the overall context of the book of Mark. What Mark is about is to try to prove Jesus to the Gentiles, and we're talking about the Gentiles who have been influenced by Roman culture, to answer by answering the question, who is this man? The first few um, uh, miracles that Jesus is going to perform in the book of Mark, and you've got the, the, some of the text down there at the end of those, that's the response that he gets. What sort of man is this? What kind of man is it that can do it? Who is this guy that can do these things that are being done? And Mark is trying to get us to ask that question ourselves so that he can begin to answer that question. Okay. Now one of the things that Mark does is, is uh, here's an interesting study for you to do sometime. Go through the book of Mark and notice all of the here words. All the times that Jesus is speaking, that God is speaking, that others are speaking about him, what they're hearing. And then go back through and study all the times that, that Mark uses sight words, what they saw, what they observed. It's really interesting to notice how much that Mark, every chapter, in fact, in the book of Mark, there's hearing and sight words. Because what he's trying to get them to do is hear some evidence. We're talking about witnessing Jesus Here's some evidence about Jesus, okay? Here, here's what he did. Here's what he said. Here's what others saw. Here's what others heard from him. So now, what are you going to do with that information? When you're asked the question, who is Jesus? Are you going to look at what he has said, what he's done, and follow him or not? So what you have is in the middle of this book, kind of, uh, pretty much in the middle of the book, You've got a real significant piece of the, the puzzle that goes on. Mark 8, 27 through Mark 9, 1 is really the hub of this entire book. And you can see that in a couple of ways. First of all, before you get to Mark chapter 8 and verse 27, there's 26 uh, miracles that Jesus performs in the book of Mark. 20 of them are in the first half. Six of them is all that's in the second half. And those six are almost all related to his death, burial, and resurrection. So there's something that is different that's happening afterwards. In the first half of the book, he's trying to impress you with what Jesus is doing, these miracles that he's performing, so that you're asking the same question that those early people did in the book, saying, who is this man? Who is it that can do these kinds of things? Who is it that can perform these miracles, these wonders? He's not just an ordinary man, so who is he? And then the second thing we notice is that when you get to Mark 8, 27 and beyond, there are these eight suffering statements where Jesus says something to the effect of that he's going to have to go to Jerusalem, suffer, and die. And once we get to the middle point of this book, 
from there on out, Jesus' attention and Mark's attention as he's writing this book is focusing on Jesus heading to Jerusalem for him ultimately to die on a cross for our sins. So what he's doing in the first half of the book is he's saying, look at what Jesus has done. Who is this man? And then in the second half of the book, he's saying, this is who he is. He's God the Son who's died for you. Now are you willing to follow him? Because when you look at what happens in the middle here, in Mark 8, 27 through 9, 1, that's really the question that is asked. In Mark 8 and verse 27, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? Remember, that's the question of the book. Who is this man? So now that you've seen all of these 20 of the 26 miracles, now that you've seen what Jesus has done, things that no one else could have done, who do people think that I am? Who are people saying that I am? And they give him some answers, of course. Some say that that you're John the Baptist. Others say that you're Elijah. Others say that you're one of the prophets. But he continued questioning them, and he asked the disciples now point blank, who do you say that I am? I mean, you've seen all the miracles. You've been with me from the get-go of my ministry. You've seen lots of things. You've heard lots of things. If anyone should know who I am, you should know. So who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, being the, the outspoken one that he always was, says you're the Christ. That's the Greek equivalent of the, the Hebrew word, you're the Messiah. Both of those means you're the anointed one. You are the king, see. Now, I I don't know that Peter really got what was going on. Even though he recognizes he's the Christ, he didn't, I don't think, really get what that means fully. And we're going to see that in the next few verses. But Jesus warns him to tell no one about him. It's not time for them to to know that then and then he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again this is the first of those eight suffering statements he begins to tell them that and as he was stating the matter plainly peter took him aside and began to rebuke him can you imagine that I, I, I sit and think about trying to find some kind of equivalence to that, and I, I've never really done a good job of that. But it would kind of be like me pulling Michael Jordan aside and saying, hey, this basketball thing, I think you need to really work on your free throws. And here's some tips for you, okay? We called it beef when I was in high school. You can balance, eye on the ball, elbow in, follow through. You try that, Michael, you might get a little bit better at this free throw shooting. You know what Michael Jordan would tell me if I tried to give him advice on how to, how to shoot free throws? He would say, um, how many minutes did you average playing at Dresden High School in Dresden, Tennessee? And I would say, um, three. And he would say, what did you do best when you play basketball? Take charges. <laughs> I mean, it would be ridiculous. But even that's not really equivalent of what's going on here is it? it'd be kind of like me taking Peyton Manning aside and saying I got some tips on how to break down game film for you okay not reading the defense very well even that would be not the same it'd be kind of like me pulling aside a, a Steve Jobs or someone of that that ilk and saying you know when it comes to running a company I ran a little Greenfield Monument Works for a little while back it, it's no comparison Even that, as ridiculous as those sound, this is far beyond that, isn't it? He pulls Jesus aside and says, listen, you don't know what you're saying, buddy. That can't happen. So notice how Jesus rebukes him. He turns around, seeing his disciples. He said, get behind me, Satan. That's a pretty harsh rebuke, isn't it? Calls him Satan. For you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man." Who do you say that I am? You're the king. Do you backtalk the king? Do you tell the king he's doing wrong? Now, maybe we don't get that as well living in America because we're you know, a democratic republic. We're not living under a monarchy. We don't, we don't like what our president does and we tweet about it or post on Facebook or someone writes an editorial. 
We don't like what our congressman is doing, our governor's doing, our mayor's doing, any of those kinds of things. We, we will openly rebuke them. But you don't rebuke the king. If you rebuke the king, guess what happens? You ever heard off with their heads before in a movie? That's what happens. So who is he? Are, is he the king or not? Are you, are you going to follow? He says you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Are you following the king or are you following yourself? And then notice what he says. He summoned the crowd to his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must three things. He must deny himself. That means I'm no longer in charge. He must take up his cross. Sometimes we'll use this to talk about, you know, the cross. It's just the cross I have to bear. You know, I've got, uh, got a bum leg. It's the cross I have to bear. Uh, I've got a, got a, uh, a brother-in-law that's always running me down for being a Christian. It's just the cross I have to bear. Guess what they use the cross for? To kill people. And that's what Jesus means here. Is that I'm no longer going to let myself live. We're not talking about physically. Don't go, you know, lock yourself in a room in a gas chamber or something like that. But, but it's not me. I'm putting myself, my will, my desire, my wants, my wishes, I'm putting all of them to death. I've got to deny myself. I've got to put to death my wants, wishes, and desires. And I've got to follow Jesus because he's the king, right? And if after those 20 miracles in the first half of the book, if we get that he's the Christ, this is the next step, isn't it? It's the, it's the he's more powerful than me. He's more knowledgeable than me. He's more everything than me. And I've got to follow him. And then he goes on to, to uh, give some illustrations of that. Whoever wishes to... Uh, Follow after him, you know, there's going to be those who are going to have to, to give up the things that they want. And he gives some examples of that through there. But the idea that he's getting at is how are you going to live your life? How are you going to live your life? Story is told about uh, there was a duck church at one time. Um, just bear with me a little bit. There's a duck church at one time where all the ducks would assemble every day. They would fill up the duck pews. They would sing the duck hymns. The duck preacher would get up there and open the duck Bible because they had to have their own version of the Bible, you know. They open up the duck Bible and he would preach to them, you are more than what you are. You can fly. And every one of the ducks would amen with a duck quack. And then after services were over, they would waddle back home. And then what that what we do in the church? We gather together and we sing praises to God and we talk about how wonderful He is and this is what we ought to do. And then we follow the same path so many times that we did when we got there. And Jesus is saying that's not good enough. Mark's gospel is to help us see that if we get who He is... There's going to be a change in the way we live. And sometimes we will talk about our faith that we have, but then whenever it's time to make a decision, do we make that decision based on faith? Or do we make it based on the bottom line? How many, how many times have there been great ideas that have come up in men's business meetings and elders meetings within a congregation and someone says, well, we don't have the manpower to do that. We don't have the finances to do that. We don't have the, the we tried that back in 1987 and it didn't work. So there's no sense in trying it now. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be level-headed and make good decisions, but I'm saying where does faith come into the equation? Do we believe that he's the Christ, the son of the living God or not? Do we believe he has the power that he claims he did? Are we willing to step out on faith? And so many times I want to say, well, when this gets lined out and when this happens and when that happens, one of the things I get to do in the roles that I'm at is, is to encourage young men to come to preaching school 
And one of the things I love about our students is they are guys and ladies that as couples or individually so many times, they didn't know how they were gonna ha- it was going to happen. They didn't know how the budget was going to be met, but they said, I'm going to trust God is going to take care of us. And he has. Are we willing to make those kinds of decisions? Are we willing to follow exactly what he says? I love in the movie... Uh, Indiana Jones, where he's at that point in the, in the cave. He's looking at the map, and the map says, keep going forward. And he's looking forward, and there's a, looks like an 8,000-foot drop. You remember the scene I'm talking about? And he looks at the map, and he looks down, and he looks at the map, and he looks down, and finally he just kind of goes, and what happened? There's that rock that appeared, right? Well, the rock was there the whole time. But he couldn't see it till he took a step. I, I'm almost convinced that's the way that God works in our lives. He's there all along. He's waiting us to recognize who He is and take a step in faith and follow Him. To deny self, take up our cross and follow Him. And then with each step Indiana Jones took, he took a little faith, but it was a lot easier after the previous step, wasn't it? And it gets that way for us. And then after this in Mark, what you're going to see is all of these different examples. And for time's sake, we're not going to go through all of them uh, in great detail. But just look there in, in Mark chapter 9. If you look at verses uh, 33, they come into Capernaum. And, uh, and, and Jesus is talking, hearing the t- disciples talk rather the whole time. And, and they get into the house there in Capernaum. And Jesus finally says, all right, what were you talking about on the way? And they said, we were talking about which one of us is the greatest. You're following Jesus down the road and you're arguing about who's the greatest. Again, it's like me going to lunch with Kobe Bryant and and Shaquille O'Neal and Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and saying, you know, guys, (laughs) I took a charge against South Fulton one time. I mean, it's ridiculous. You're in the presence of Jesus and you're saying, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. And this is a conversation that goes on with the disciples for a long time. Because even when they're sitting around the table in the upper room right before Jesus is about to die, guess what they're still arguing about? Which one of them is the greatest? Guess what they're doing? They're serving self. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you're going to deny self, take up your cross, and follow me, but that's not what they were doing. You jump on down to verse 38, and, and then they want to try it because they've been pointed out that they're doing Je- Jesus, we, we saw some guys, and they were casting out spirits. They were doing miracles, and, and they weren't one of us. What should we do about that? You see the jealousy that that rings of, what the, what's going on there? And Jesus said, if he's on our side, you don't have to worry about it. They're worried about their position. Jesus says, you got to deny self, take up your cross and follow me. Then they get this conversation that follows in uh, verses 43 through 50 about that if your right hand offends you, if your right foot offends you, if your right eye offends you, guess what you're supposed to do? Now, he's not saying literally we're supposed to pluck out our eye and cut our eye. What he's saying is you ought to be willing to do whatever it takes to get sin out of your life. Uh, one of the things that uh, Denny, uh, is, uh, at Denny Petrillo back at Bear Valley Valley Institute will always talk to the students about is pornography. I mean, it's rampant in our society. Rampant. Even in the church, it's rampant with our young men especially. One of the things that he'll, he'll tell them, if you need help with this, let me help you. And he'll, he'll recommend programs like Covenant Eyes and those kinds of things that help. He had a, a, a guy come to him one time. He wasn't a student, but he had a guy come to him one time and, and told him, you know, I'm struggling with pornography. I need some help. And then he's telling me, you know, we need to get covenant eyes put on your laptop. And he said, yes, sir. And he does that. And he set Denny up as to be the guy that the reports would be sent to. And he said, we need to do the same thing for your smartphone. Where's it at? And he said, it's in the middle of Sloan's Lake. And he said, what's it doing there? And he said, I had to get rid of it because I couldn't stop. That's a man that's struggling with sin but realizes I need to do whatever it takes to get over it. That's what Jesus is talking about in Mark 9, 43 through 50. And we're willing to do that if we deny self, 
take up our cross and follow Him, aren't we? Uh, you can look on down in, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, and Jesus starts talking about divorce. And they're asking about these questions because I want to do what I want. When it comes to marriage, divorce, remarriage, you know why I want it my way? Because I'm not willing to deny self, take up my cross, and follow Him. Has Jesus been clear on His teaching about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? One man and one woman are supposed to get married and stay together until one of them dies. Why do we have so many questions about it? It's because I want what we're not denying self. We're not taking up our cross. We're not following Him. This rich young ruler comes to Jesus and, and asks Him, you know, what is it that I need to do to inherit eternal life? And He says, you need to, to you know the law. You need to, to obey your parents. You need to do this. He says, I've done all of that since the time I was born up. And He says, well, then there's one thing you like. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. He's not saying that's a blanket statement for all of us because, again, nothing wrong with being rich. But what he's saying to this guy is that's the one thing you're not willing to give up. And guess what he did? He went away sorrowful because he was unwilling to deny self, take up his cross, and follow him. And then we come over to Matthew chapter 12, and in verse 38, he was teaching the disciples and saying, Beware of the scribes who like, notice what they like, to walk around in long robes. That, that was a sign that they had all these tassels and I'm somebody that's really important as a teacher. They like to walk around in long robes. They like respectful greetings. They like chief seats. They like places of honors. They devour widows' houses. They like, appear, for, for appearance sake, offer long prayers. They are wanting man's attention. They're in it for themselves. Guess what they're not doing? They're not denying self. They're not taking up their cross. They're not following him. They're not recognizing him as king. And it's immediately after this that Jesus sits down and notices how they were giving. You know what impressed Jesus so much about the widow? It wasn't that he had any fault with what the rich did. What impressed Jesus so much, what he commends so much, is what it says in this last line. It says, she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. But you know what that really is saying? She denied self, she took up her cross, and she followed him. And from Mark chapter 8, all the way to here, that's one example after another that we have of this is what I'm expecting you to do. Because all of these suffering statements are pointing us to the fact, the place where Jesus is going to be the ultimate example of that, isn't he? He's going to get down on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. And he's going to say, I don't want this to happen. If there's any other way, don't let it be this way. Yet, not I will, what I will, but what you will. I'm willing to deny myself, to take up my cross, and to follow you. And if Jesus willing is willing to do that, shouldn't we? You know what Jesus, who Jesus is really commending in Mark chapter 12? He's commending the committed. That's what he wants from us. Jesus doesn't care if you're the best preacher or the worst preacher. I'm thankful for that. Jesus doesn't care if you're the, the biggest giver or the smallest giver. Jesus doesn't care if you're the most talented teacher or the least talented teacher. He doesn't care if you're the, the most well-known and beloved brother in the congregation or the person that, that nobody really knows what all they do. You know what Jesus cares about? is that if in any role that you're in, are you committed to him or are you not? That's what impresses him. That's what he commands. And that's what's important to him. 
Back in uh, 2011, Les Miles was then the coach of the LSU Tigers, and he was reportedly considering uh, leaving LSU to go to the University of Michigan. Their job had just opened, and that would have been something appealing to him because he played it at uh, Michigan. That was his alma mater, and, and uh, everyone kind of assumed that, that he would want to go there. They offered him... It seems small now in today's market, but offered him $4 million a year to be the coach at the University of Michigan. He met with the Michigan officials. He talked with them, and he ultimately decided to stay at LSU for $3.5 million. Now, I know you're saying, well, that's still a lot of money, but half a million dollars you're giving up is nothing to sneeze at either, right? But in all the talk... Les Miles about him possibly leaving LSU and, and uh, all the, the things that they, that they uh, uh, the reasons that the pundits would give. They would talk about how that it's, it would be easier for him to create a championship team at Michigan where they hadn't won in a long time rather than to sustain a championship team at LSU. But he chose to stay at LSU, and this is the reason that he gave was because I'm committed to our program. He took less money and a harder job because he had made a commitment to his employers and to his uh, athletes that he had recruited. Commitment is something that we don't see a lot in our society today, but it's to be commended. And in the church, what impresses Jesus the most is our being willing to be committed to him he commended the widow for that and one day wouldn't it be great to have him commend us by saying well done thou good and faithful servant our lord commands the committed so may we be committed to him appreciate it